we're ready to go. But he disdained to lay hands. This is talking about Haman. He disdained to lay hands on Mordecai. Where am I? Alone. On Mordecai alone. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur, that is, the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other people's laws, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed." And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. So the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agadite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money and the people are given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were called on the 13th day of the first month and a decree was written according to all that Haman commanded. To the king's satraps, to the governors who were over each province, to the officials of all people, to, <coughs> excuse me, lost my place, where are you? to every province according to, to its script and to every people in their language. In the name of King Ahasuerus, it was written and sealed with the king's signet ring. And the letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children, and women, in one day, on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the document was to be issued as law in every province, being published for all people, that they should be ready for that day. The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink. But the city of Shushan was perplexed. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to the part where we open your word, your holy word, your true word, sharper than a two-edged sword. We pray that this morning... You'll speak to each one of our hearts, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear you and your message from you. Amen. The sharing, never the sermon. It's got a kind of a, I was going to say depressing, not a encouraging really, title this week. It's called Haman's Horrible Hostile Habits. I forget what you call it when each letter begins, each word begins with the same letter, something. But a quick review of what we've covered so far, because we've looked at ah Ahasuerus, I'm still practicing that, and Vashti, that was the first week. Second week we looked at Esther and the pathway that her life has taken up until now. Now, while Esther and Mordecai and the Jews within Persia may have rejoiced that Esther was crowned as queen, they would soon find themselves dealing with an executive order from Ahasuerus that would strike fear in their hearts. Did you notice at the end of that reading it said they were perplexed? That's quite an 
interesting reaction to what they've just heard, those poor Jew people, Jewish people. Well, you and I can look at the story, this whole story, with a level of confidence, because we know already right today how it's going to end. However, the average Jew in Persia at that time was living that story in real time. They didn't know the end, did they? So let's go back a bit. We've come to chapter 3, and we're introduced to the next main character in the book, and his name is Haman. This is a man who'd been exalted by the king. He was a capable man, a Persian man, a man who'd been lifted up above other princes and other royal officials. But there's something really interesting about this man, Haman, and this is the key to the whole story, so we have to understand this before we go any further. He was an Agagite. It says that in chapter 3, verse 1, and in verse 10. And it says it again in, in chapter 8. It says, Haman the Agagite. It keeps repeating that, because it's not a small detail. It's the origin of Haman's hatred for Mordecai and his hatred for the Jews. Now, it's important that we understand and to know that he was an Agagite, so we've got to go back a bit. Let's go back almost a thousand years to the exodus from Egypt. The Israelites came out of Egypt around 1445 BC. So we're about nearly a thousand years before. And they're attacked in the 17th chapter of Exodus by the Amalekites. Does anyone remember that name? The Amalekites attack them. The Amalekites were the descendants of Esau, the one who sold his birthright. Because the Amalekites attacked the Jews, God cursed the Amalekites. And God's curse in 25, Deut Deuteronomy 25 says, one day they're going to be extinct. God pronounces a curse on the Amalekites. Well, four centuries later, King Saul conquers the Amalekites. That's in 1 Samuel. He captures the king, and his name is Agag. He's the king of the Amalekites. Now, Saul was supposed to kill him, but he didn't do it. He let him live. And then Saul incur incurred the Lord's displeasure, and for that and other things he had done that displeased the Lord. The throne was removed from his family, and the prophet Samuel stepped in. And do you know what Samuel did? To Agag? Well, you can look it up in 1 Samuel 15, verse 33. We won't go into graphic details, but he hacked him to pieces. Yeah. True story. Haman was an Agagite. And although almost a millennium had passed since the curse and hundreds of years had passed since the hacking of Agag to death, Haman knew his family history and he knew that it was a Jewish man, a Jewish prophet, in, by the name of Samuel, who'd hacked his ancestor to pieces. And to make it even worse, Mordecai is a descendant of Kish. Now that's in chapter 2, verse 5. From the tribe of Benjamin. And Benjamin is in the line of Saul. So they knew their history. There was a deep-seated animosity between the descendants of Saul and the descendants of Agag for obvious reasons. And though nearly, what, 550 years? Seems a long time to me. Had passed. Both Haman and Mordecai, Haman the Agagite and Mordecai the Benjaminite, had not forgotten the tribal feud that was so ancient. So the hostility erupts in chapter 3. Now we're going to look at verse 2 and then down to 5. Here we go. All the king's servants were within the king's gate. They bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. Now Haman had been elevated so high that everyone had to bow to him. There's always a but, isn't there? But Mordecai wouldn't bow or pay homage. The feud had settled in his heart deeply, and he had nothing but animosity toward the Amalekite descendant. 
when uh, Haman saw that Mordecai didn't bow or pay homage, Haman was filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they'd told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the, the people of Mordecai. He decided he wouldn't just kill Mordecai, he'd go for his people and he was going to kill all of them. So what does he do? He goes to the magicians and the astrologers and he says, I want you to determine the optimum day by looking into your mystical sources and find a day to annihilate all the Jewish people. We'll have genocide all through the Persian Empire on that day. Nice person, eh? He then goes to the king and he says to the king, this nation, this Persian Empire, is full of a certain people and they're a threat to the empire. They're a threat to your throne and they ought to be eliminated. They've got to be killed all the way back to Israel. They're a threat to your throne, therefore we will kill them all, we'll confiscate all their property and their spoils and everything they own. Ah, serious. Now you notice, you've got to notice this. He says it straight away. Great idea. Yeah, great idea. He hands his signet ring over to Haman so that Haman can stamp the signet ring on documents that will authorise the genocide of the Jews. Haman's not going to muck around. He hits the fast track. He dispatches the royal decree and sends it throughout the entire empire. And remember we talked in the first um, sharing about how vast and how big the Persian Empire was in those days? And they did it like Pony Express. A horse would ride so far as it could ride with its message, and another horse and another rider would go from there, and then that, that's how they spread the word through. So the word was spread everywhere rapidly, with fresh horses and fresh riders all across the entire Persian Empire. Think about that. That a date had been established. Quote, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, all of them. Pretty big stuff. So we're going to have a look, close look at this guy, Haman. Did you notice from the title of the sharing, there's three important words, horrible, hostile and habits. Horrible, causing or likely to cause horror, extremely disagreeable or cruel, that's him. So you can tick that one. Hostile, unfriendly, belligerent, antagonist, antagonistic, unkind, a psychological trait characterised by a mixture of anger and disgust. Tick that one. He fits the box. Habit. A settled tendency or usual manner of behaviour. Tick that one because this, we see this coming through. And we'll see other examples of other ha habits of Haman later on in the book. So let's look closely at this man's habits and see if we can learn something that we could be aware of in our lives. We need to be aware. Haman had a heart full of idolatry, but his main idol was himself. He was actually the letter I in the word idolatry. He was a me, myself and I person. The fact that Mordecai wouldn't bow to Haman infuriated Haman. But why was he so angry? Because he had a massive ego. He enjoyed all the people paying homage to him, bowing to him. One person refuses to do it, and he's so annoyed. Maybe it reminded him that he couldn't actually control everyone like he wanted to. Hang on a minute. What do we, you and I, idolise in our lives? Idolatry in jo Judaism and Christianity is a definition. The worship of someone or something other than God as though it were God. Idols are anything that we give our lives to. Anything that we place above God. There are many idols that we could struggle with 
or they could just creep into our lives without us even knowing. What are some of these possible idols? Wealth, prosperity, career success, image, weight and appearance, hobbies, fitness, even our own safety and security. We've got to be careful what we cling to. Ultimately, all people worship one of two beings, God or themselves. An idol is something that means you or, you or I are glorified and not God. An idol consumes our thoughts. So we ask ourselves, well, what does modern day idolatry look like? Well, John Piper says it starts in the heart, craving, wanting, enjoying, being satisfied by anything more than God. So here's the big question for you and me. What's God's word calling us to do? Well, God's word's calling us to take stock of our hearts and the idols that we've bought, built there. God's heart is for all people and he generously invites us to be part of the work that he's doing. But we can't wholeheartedly participate in his work with him if we're distracted and thrown off course by idols or other issues, other things in our lives. I just want to read two verses from Colossians, chapter, sorry, yeah, verses from Colossians. Just got to find it. It's here. Colossians 3, 17 and verse 23. Colossians 3, 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And verse 23, but he that doeth wrong shall receive all the wrong which, oh sorry, 23, but whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So let's move on to the second of Haman's horrible hostile habits. Haman had a heart that was full of anger and hatred towards the Jews. We've already heard how Haman reacted when Mordecai wouldn't pay homage to him. Now that word in the Bible, that word wrath, it's the Hebrew word kima, and it means a burning anger or poison. So that's pretty serious stuff, isn't it? That's very serious. It's actually malice. And malice is that deep-seated anger that brings delight if our enemy suffers and pain if our enemy succeeds. Malice can never forgive. It must always take revenge. Malice has a good memory for hurts and a bad memory for kindnesses. Think back to Haman's history. In 1 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul compared malice to yeast because like yeast, malice begins very small but gradually grows and finally permeates the whole of life. Malice in a Christian's, lo Christian's life grieves the Holy Spirit and must be put out of our lives. Now we've got Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. But be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. The insidious Thing about malice is that it has to act and eventually it has to express itself and when you shoot at your enemy beware for the ammunition usually ricochets off the target and comes back towards the shooter if a person wants to self-destruct the fastest way to do it is to be like Haman and have a malicious spirit but what does God's word tell us well Proverbs 6, 
16 to 19 says, there are six things that Yahweh hates and seven things that are abominations to his soul. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a devising heart, plans of deception, feet that hurry to evil, and a false witness who breathes lies and sends out discord between brothers. It's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? But we want to look at the positive stuff too. God's calling us to have an altar in our hearts that is only for him and his will. So, number three of Haman's horrible, hostile habits. He hatches a heinous crime. He was so filled with hatred and malice that he went to the king and arranged for him to annihilate all the certain people who keep to themselves separate. Notice he did not use the title Jews. Now this was likely not a spontaneous thought, but one that he'd been plotting and scheming for a long time, because in fact, Haman was a pawn in Satan's much bigger plan. And this was to take place in 11 months' time. It's important here to note that a lot was cast to decide the day and the month that this event was going to happen. Satan has sought to hinder and destroy the people of God since the first of creation. He even tried to kill Jesus as a baby, seeking to hinder him from fulfilling God's plan of redemption. And Satan continues to work in the world and in the church today. We all know that. We don't have to look far around the world to see where Satan is doing a pretty big job. We must be wise to the evil schemes of the enemy. Haman sought favour before Assyrius. He presented his evil plan, but he had to have the approval of the king. His hatred of the Jews was so intense, he was willing to pay 10,000 talents from his own money in order to eliminate them. Now, Satan is seeking to <coughs> unite humanity against the church, striving to hinder the divine purposes of God. He wants the church to cease to exist. We have to remember, we belong to the Lord and he's coming again for his church. And I believe, sincerely believe, that we are certainly living in the last days now. And it's quite exciting, very exciting. But we belong to the Lord. King Ahasuerus offers his ring to Haman in order to seal the deal with his approval. Now, Haman's accusations were without merit, but he gained the approval of the king. Having read the book of Esther, we know that at this stage of the, of the story, Ahasuerus had no idea that, of the implications that this would have on his new queen, Esther. He didn't know at the stage that she was a Jew, because Mordecai had told her to keep that quiet. So without investigation or consideration, he's just in with Haman right off the bat. He's approved of it. Go for it. Proverbs 18.13 says, He who answereth a matter before he hears it is folly and shame unto him. Think about that. He didn't think about it. He didn't say to Haman, look, I better go and think about this. Hmm, might be a good plan, but you know, maybe we should draw up a committee and have a discussion and think about it before we go into it. But no, 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 he quick, rips his ring off here, take the ring, it's all on. Can you see an irony here? Ahasuerus and Haman felt as if they had patched hatched a plan that could not fail. The money was available. Haman had the king's backing. But, there's another but, they failed to figure in one major factor, and that is the sovereign will of God. Because remember, right when we started this series, I said, we all know, God's 
name is not mentioned in that book at all, but his sovereign will comes right through the story. They didn't factor that in. All the planning and the resources that Persia possessed would never thwart the divine plan of God for his people. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? I honestly can't imagine waking up one day to such news as the Jews in Persia did when this decree was signed. They only had one thing they could do, and that was to look to the Lord and God and depend on him. God was their only hope. But we know, because we know the end of the story, that God's going to prove himself mighty and he is going to continue to preserve them. We can take a lesson from that, that we too must continue to depend on the Lord for the needs of each day. And remember this, the whole weight of the Persian Empire, let's face it, was obviously pretty, pretty big and pretty strong, did not stop God from keeping his promises. Remember Easter, I shared about the, the empty promises of God. God's a God of promises, 7,000 promises in the Bible. And in the next and there will be a next because it will now be the third Sunday of this month, and the last instalment, we know already that Haman is not going to succeed in his plans. Now, I've asked Ali to come and read for us Psalm 1 because I think it's a really nice way to end this sharing. Two men, two ways, two destinies. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So God has promised, and so it will be. In the name of the Father, and in the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that we have the privilege of knowing the end of that story, which the people, the Jews in Persia, Persia did not. But we just thank you that you kept your promise to them, just as you keep your promise to us today. We thank you that you're a God of promises and you do keep them. And we pray that this week, as we go out into our week, whatever it brings, that we will remember that we need to depend on you, that, that you are the one who can guide us, protect us, look after us and provide our needs. And we just commit this next week into your hands, each person here. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen.